All right, so our, our format for this afternoon is we are going to run, we're run through, we're going to go through Daniel chapter 9 because this is a stunning prophecy. It's not just a prophecy, it's almost a breathtaking prophecy, especially when we look back and we see what happened in history. So it's so important, and then we'll move into Daniel chapter 8 because maybe it's not so visible in Daniel chapter 8, but I don't know if you know this, I'm, I'm surprised at how few people in our church know this, how closely related these prophecies are. So in our prophecy weekend, again, we're wanting to leave you with hope. So when we talk about prophecy, it's not just something, well, we kind of think it's a little, the deeper you dig, the more confidence you can have and the more hope you have that God's word is sure, not just in prophecy, but in everything. When God says something, and he says it all the time, over and over in Revelation, write this down for it is trustworthy and true. He says that multiple times. It's trustworthy and true. And we're going to see uh, how that is. So you're welcome to go through, or you can just, I've got all the words on the slides. So if, it's, uh, if you're too tired to lift a Bible to your, you know, uh, after lunch, you can just read on the, on the sides. Daniel 9 starts off this. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descendants. So this is after Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is gone. And now you have the per Persians and the Medes. So this is talking about a time when, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is off the scene. Even though Nebuchadnezzar, we saw last night, was a violent king. He was actually converted, became a believer in Yahweh, and actually wrote one of the chapters of the book of Daniel. Never think somebody's beyond the reach of the grace of God. It's, a, it's an incredible thing when we look in the book of Daniel. So in the first year of Darius, uh, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, now the Persians are ruling, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last seven years, 70 years, excuse me. So you can imagine how discouraged Daniel was. Uh, 70 years. I mean, he was hoping to go home. He was hoping to get back to his home in Jerusalem. He'd been gone ever since he was a teenager. And now he, he's stuck there in Babylon and praying about it. Can you imagine being in a foreign country uh, under a foreign, working for a foreign government for your whole life and not knowing if you'll ever get back to go back and see your home? So what did he do? As the habit of Daniel, we see he turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting, sackcloth and ashes, such a, man, you know, when you think of Daniel, and one thing if you take away from this weekend, I, th I think we need to be spending more time in prayer. I don't know about your life, but in a, in a very hectic society, it's easy to say, ah, oh, you know, we'll pray later. Daniel, when he was bothered by something, what did he do? He fasted, he prayed, sackcloth, ashes. He was really uh, desirous of knowing God's will. So this is what he does. And he prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. You just heard the sermon, right? What's the key to un un unlocking all of God's wonderful blessings? Confession. We just confess and then he pours out his blessings. Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We've sinned. We've done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commandments and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far in all the countries where you have scattered us, because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses, you remember the curses from the book of Leviticus, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. 
You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of our Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. For the Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We've done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because we are righteous but because of our great, your great mercy. You see righteousness by faith in Daniel's prayer? Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, guess who shows up? Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, and Bob will talk about this from chapter 8, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering or evening sacrifice. Do you see all the elements here? Righteousness by faith. He, he's actually not just confessing his own sin, he's confessing the sin of his people. He's confessing the sin of the church, God's people. And how does God respond to him? No, whole people are bad. We're going to punish you. It says Gabriel flies from heaven and shows up. Some of us wonder, what does God do when we pray and fast? Daniel would tell us. Messengers of heaven come and they stand by our side and encourage us to get into scripture and claim the promises. God's words are trustworthy and true. And Daniel, by the way, if anybody didn't need to confess in the Bible, I mean, what wrong do we know that Daniel did? He was a, he seemed like a very righteous guy. In fact, it always has amazed me that when the Persians came in, because the Persians, they were a little bit crazy and they were, they had very much the idea that their ruler was an omnipotent God. And so when they came in and they took over Babylon, did you notice in the book of Daniel, they left him in power and actually used him. That is highly unusual. Usually you clear out everybody, you kill them off or exile them. But Daniel was such a righteous, wise, intelligent person, which was what I believe studying prophecy does. It doesn't make us crazy, wacko, and for all you kids here, if you think, oh, we've got to study prophecy... It'll make you smarter, more compassionate, broader-minded, broader understanding of God and how he works around the world. And you will be so wise that even earthly governments will say, man, we want you. By the way, Spirit of Prophecy talks about this for our youth. Our youth should be aiming to make laws and work in the government of our country. Why? Because God needs people like Daniel in high places. Wise, intelligent, well-rounded, humble. And we can see the humility coming through. He, in a care for his people, it's not just him. He's praying for his people here. And he's asking God, please bless my people. Why, why your holy hill, your work? He's praying for the work of God on the earth. It's so, so encouraging to me. When you read t- verse 21 and 22, Gabriel shows up. From the courts of heaven. So sometimes when we study Daniel 9, we kind of 
gloss over that prayer. I didn't want to gloss over it today. I want you to understand the context of this. The context is a very intelligent, humble, elderly gentleman by this point. I think he was in his 80s, if I remember right. He was in his 80s by the time he's praying this prayer. And God says, Gabriel, go help him out. Man, does that encourage you? Encourages me. Because he says, I'm not good. I mean, he's so humble. He says, it's not because of we're so great. Just have mercy on us because of your name, because of your... So that's the context of what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 9 here. And And when did Gabriel show up? Do you think the Bible just leaves any of these details to chance? He showed up about the time of the evening sacrifice. As the lamb was being slaughtered, foretelling that a Messiah would come and take the sins of his people away. In answer to Daniel saying, Lord, forgive us of our sins. And right at the time when they were having an evening sacrifice, which was symbolic of Jesus coming, dying on a cross for us, Gabriel shows up. So what did he say? He informed me, Daniel, that is, and he said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you the ability to understand. Remember last night I told you, if you come to prophecy without a prayerful attitude, you will come up with some wild stuff. And if you don't believe me, just Google all the stuff we're talking about. Wild, wild conclusions. This is a prayerful, very studied. You can't do it quickly. It takes time. And you have to even study the history. By the way, I have four volumes in my office from Leroy Froome, who studied the development of prophetic thought over hundreds of years. What we are presenting this weekend stands firmly in the tradition of Protestant theology up until about 100 years ago, then some really wild theories started coming in. But people like Martin Luther would be... He'd be enjoying this presentation today. Isaac Newton was mentioned by Lonnie at Sabbath school. Isaac, do you know Isaac Newton? All the British couldn't believe it. The BBC was like, man, Isaac Newton thought the world was going to end in 2060. He was actually studying Daniel chapter 7 in the 1260 days. Just, he, he was basically very close to what we believe, right? What I, uh, we believe as a church about prophecy. It's come from years of people praying, studying, talking with each other, and and trying to understand what God has in mind for the church. And this is why Gabriel comes. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. Okay? Who is Daniel's holy city and holy people? The Jewish nation, right? That's, That's what... Daniel's not thinking about 2024 in Orlando, Florida. Daniel's thinking about when do I get to go home? When is the Jewish nation? When is Jerusalem going to be restored? When is the temple going to be revived? When are people going to see that we have the one God, the Shekinah glory in the temple, and God let Babylonians just come in? That's all he's concerned about. So this is talking about Daniel's people, the Jewish people, in about the year 540-something B.C., Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah, the Mashiach, will be cut off, but not for himself, And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Then he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and to offering. And on the wing of abominations will be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. And so the chapter ends. 
So what do we need to know? From Daniel 9.24 to the end, you, if you were with us when we went through the book of Revelation and Daniel, we talked about chiasms. And this is a Hebrew literary structure of where there are parallel thoughts. So it would be like making point A and then point B and then A1, B1. And the Bs are related together and the As are related together. Now, it drives Westerners crazy because we like to have a introduction, you go through to a natural conclusion, and then you have a summary at the end. They like to go, here's one topic, oh, here's another topic, oh, let's go back to the first topic, and then we'll end on the second topic. So Daniel 9, 24 through 27 is built like that. First of all, the Messiah will be cut off. That's what uh, it said. Then there will be a prince who destroys the temple. Then the Messiah and sacrifices. Do you see how they're related, the A's? And if you go back, you can look at it in your Bibles. Uh, I, I'm not going to take a lot of time because I'm trying to give Pastor Bob a little bit more time than myself because Daniel 8 is, it has a lot. So, but you see the A and the A are related. And then it ends, then there's one who makes the temple desolate. So you see there's a prince or one who makes the temple desolate and the B and then you have the A, the Messiah is cut off, Messiah and sacrifice. This will really help you when you read through it, because otherwise if you read through it, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, when does that happens at the same time as this? Because we think chronologically, right? It's not talking chronologically, it's talking about different topics as you're going through. So the A's are related together, the B's are related together, and that's called a chiastic structure that they have. So it's talking about weeks. Now weeks are these days, you talk to some people that interpret this prophecy, they will come up with days, that these are literal days. But if you go back to Numbers 1434, uh, as the children of Israel are coming out, or actually heading out of Egypt into Canaan, and you remember they sent their spies in for 40 days, and they came back, and they're like, yeah, we can't go in, all the people are too big, it's, yeah, we're not going to overtake them. And God was mad. He's like, okay, for the 40 days you were in there, you're going to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. They've, so a day for a year principle in Numbers 14, 34. You spent 40 day, unfaithful days, you're going to have 40 unfaithful years. Ezekiel had the same experience. Uh, and actually God said directly, I have laid on you a day for each year. And he made Ezekiel suffer the punishment for day for each year of unfaithfulness. So when it says 70 weeks... We would expect this to be weeks of years, not weeks of days. Well, you might think, well, how do we know that? We know that. So you, and I'll show you, and it'll come up here in a minute. It, because it, we have the advantage of living, well, almost 2,500 years after Daniel, and we can look back in history and like, yep, that's what it meant, because you'll see it here in a minute. So the other thing that you need to know uh, that our... Many scholars kind of overlook this, but it says 70 weeks are determined. And you can look in your translation what it has. That word, you need to know it in Daniel 9.24, is actually amputated. Okay, I want you to know this. What is that word, church? Determined is actually amputated. amputated. Wait a minute. How are 70 weeks amputated? What would they be amputated from? You don't give somebody something and they're like, yeah, here's an amputation. If I say, yeah, I want to amputate something from you, like, I get something from you, no? If I say the word amputate, especially if you're a doctor and you walk in, yeah, you doctors, yeah, we're, we're going to amputate your brain. I mean, give your brain some stuff, you know? You would never mix this word up. This is the word for amputation. So 70 weeks are amputated from somewhere for your people in the holy city. So where were they amputated from? Guess what? Oh, I went too fast. I didn't wait for the graphics. This is 70 weeks times seven days. It's 490 days, and they are amputated. And I'm giving you a teaser so you don't leave at the break and go home. So you actually stay and listen to Bob. They're actually amputated from the vision of Daniel 8, the 2,300 days. I say this because even in Adventist circles, well, 2,300 days, we're not really sure. No, we are sure because the 490, you're going to see it today. The 490 days that we're talking about now, they are part of the 2,300-day vision, and they are amputated. They're, they're cut out of that vision. 
So when we talk about the 2300 days, Pastor Bob will talk very definitively about them, right, Bob? Because they've been amputated out of that vision. So if, the, if this vision is going to work, then we know Daniel 8 is going to work because they are very related. They're, the one is cut out from the other one. So this is what the Bible says. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah Prince. Okay, so when do these visions start? Because one is amputated from the other one. When does it start, church? The going forth, the commandment to go back and build Jerusalem or rebuild it because it was desolate at this time. And this is what Daniel's concern is. He's not thinking you know, 2,400 years in the future. He, he wants to know when it, so God told him, okay, when the commandment goes forth, your people go back to Jerusalem. They start, re, they rebuild the city. Then this vision starts up and it'll, and it'll uh, go up until the time of the Messiah Prince. So, again, we have the advantage can you imagine, you know, Daniel doesn't know all this. By the way, I went to uh, Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and they have some bones from the prophet Daniel uh, that um, Tamerlane, actually, he was buried in Iran or Persia at the time, and they were having a uh, plague there in Uzbekistan. So Tamerlane, he actually owned Iran or was ruling over it. So he sent a, a legate to ah, request that the bones of Daniel be brought to Samarkand, Uzbekistan which was his capital. So I actually went there, and I was thinking about it. Daniel knew nothing about, the, about this fulfillment of these visions. So this will be interesting when we get to heaven, and Daniel will be like, whoa, wow, that's what it was. So Daniel doesn't know this, but after Daniel died, in 457 B.C., there were three decrees, but the main one when the Jews could go back and actually have their own uh, legal system and establish their city was in 457 B.C., and the Persians said, okay, you go back and you can rebuild Jerusalem. Boom, the prophecy starts. And we're on the clock now for 490 days or 490 years. Well, how do we know that? You might be skeptical. Well, are you sure, Pastor, does this really work? Well, let's see. So 457, and if you start the 2300, it'll go up to 1844. We'll get into that here in a little bit in, in Bob's presentation. So there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then the street will be built again and the wall, even in trouble sometimes. Which from history we know. If you read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, there were trouble sometimes trying to rebuild Jerusalem. But he said it will be rebuilt and then there will be seven weeks and then 62 new weeks, so we're up to 69 weeks. And then something's going to happen there. It, so this takes us up 483 years to the year 27 AD. So, it, again, if you're living in the time of Daniel, you'd be very confused. What's going to happen in 27 AD? We don't have to be confused. We know what happened in the year 27 AD. You know what happened in the year 27 AD? Jesus was baptized. Just let that sink in for a minute. Daniel, 500 years before Jesus came, knew the exact year Jesus would be baptized. He was given that time frame. said from 457 B.C., you add on the 69 weeks, you come up to the exact date when Jesus goes in the water and begin, begins his ministry. After the 62 weeks, so there are seven weeks and 62, total 69, we're up to that last week. After the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself and the people, the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So again, remember, don't get confused by that last part because that will happen after the prophecy because that's another power. That's after these weeks are decreed, the 70 weeks for the Jewish people. To fulfill the mission of God. This should be very sobering. God does not have unlimited mercy for his people. There comes a drawing line where he says, okay, I'm going to use another group. 
No group, including our church or any other church or any other movement, can say we are God's people forever. I want you even to think about this in terms of current events right now. To claim that a people are God's people forever is not true. Because that gives people license over God to do whatever they want. And then we become God's. Now, God uses us. We don't use God, right? There's a difference. And God here in this prophecy told Daniel, and if we think God is, you know, capricious in this, this is seven generations. That's how, that's how merciful God is. He does not say, okay, I give you, I, yeah, I give you till six o'clock tonight. He gives us decades. He gives us centuries for his people to come around and figure out what he's doing. But he does have an end. And he will put a time, time frame, which is what prophecy is about. What are those time frames? So God told the Jewish people, and Daniel, he said, I'm going to give them seven generations from this time. They're going to go back to Jerusalem. They're going to have seven generations, 70 years, 490, which interestingly enough is when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive Seven times? I tell you, 70 times seven. Because that's how much God can forgive. 490. So, great, 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 great grandfathers, and your great, 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 great grandfathers, and, and so on and so forth. And God waits and waits and waits. But he does want his people to understand and participate with him and work with them. And he says, if that doesn't work, then the people, the prince who is to come, will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, which we know in 70 AD, after Jesus was rejected as a whole by the Jewish nation, not by Jewish people, but as a whole in their teachings and in their system, um, that God did withdraw his protection in Jerusalem. Was, the Romans said they didn't want anybody ever to know that anyone ever lived there. 70 AD, they raised it to the ground. And it was pretty clear. That's why there is a diaspora to this day of Jews around the world. They had to leave. But, back to our prophecy. After the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. But not for himself. That's for his people. Then he will confirm a covenant with many. With the world. For one week. But in the middle of the week... He will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, which is very interesting for Daniel to think about because that's what Daniel wanted to see back in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you'll have this amount of time, but in the middle of that last week, the 70th week, I'm going to cut it off, the Messiah will be cut off, and there will be no more sacrifice, no more offerings. They will not be needed. Does that ring a bell at all for you when Jesus died and all of a sudden what happened in the temple? curtain gets ripped holy place most holy place visible and you know the way yeah it's it'd be an incredible description to, to think what the priest was doing at that moment as he sees the holy place and the most holy place completely open and the shekinah glory not there it's prophesied in that middle of that week he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering so what happens in the middle of that week the cross. What year is that? 31 AD. That's the year that we, when we look at history, believe that Jesus died. And it was told to Daniel. Stunning. This is breathtaking when you think of it. That the top people around the time of Jesus... Because Paul said when the time had come, Jesus came to his people and they knew him not. Had they paid attention to what Daniel was saying, God had given them these seven generations, 490 years, to study the word, to understand prophecy. If you don't, if this doesn't sober you up this Sabbath afternoon, I know some of us have, you know, kind of a food coma going on. Uh, but man, this should sober us up. They had it right in their pews. They could have known it. And Jesus showed up right on time, the exact year that, Je that, that God had told Daniel he would come. They could have known. 
You don't think they had other things to think about? Business pursuits, uh, people getting married in their families. You don't think they had other, uh, you know, yards to take care of, fields to go out and plow and and plant and, and reap? Yeah, they did. But God gave them 490 years to study and know. Do all of us have other things going on through our minds and things we have to do in our families? And yes, we do. But I believe God does expect us to take time to pray like Daniel and to understand what is going on. And that leads us up to 34 AD. Now, we're not so sure on this date, but it probably is very close to when Stephen was stoned. If you read the book of Acts uh, and you remember, there was a great persecution on the church. And that was kind of, you know, if I were God the Father, I probably would have said, what, you killed my son? Well, we're, I'm done. We're shortening these. It's a 69 and a half week prophecy. Sorry. But he didn't. He sent the apostles. They worked in Jerusalem. They went preaching. And you can read about it in the Acts, the first chapters of Acts. They go out preaching. They're, they're still working. But about Acts 7 is when the Jewish leaders, they they. Uh, they even want to squelch out that movement. And Stephen says, you guys are a bunch of hard-hearted people. And he knew he wasn't going to end that speech because he was going through the whole history of the Jewish nation. And he saw, he, if you read it, he cuts it short at the end. He just jumps over about 600 years, goes straight to the, he says, you guys are hard-hearted. And they said, let's stone you. And they stoned him and killed him. And then the, the, the apostles went out to the whole world, probably about 34 A.D., Again, right on time, when God said he would give these 70 weeks. So I want to ask you today, are you waiting for the Messiah? I tell you, whenever um, I'm in the hospital or I'm with any of you or our church members or family or friends that are sick, I think, man, when is Jesus going to come? When is he going to wrap this up? When is he going to end it? Daniel 9 would tell us, you better pay attention. You better pay attention because God isn't just random. He, well, should I send Jesus about now? Mm, I don't know, maybe. By the way, if you think about the Garden of Gethsemane, you wonder why Jesus was agonizing so much in the Garden of Gethsemane. He couldn't put it off a year. He's going to say, God, please give me one more year. I've done that. God, please, not right now. Can you, can you postpone that? Postpone that trial. I don't want to go through that right now. And that's what he was asking. Lord, if you can take this cup from me, take it from me. But he had made a date. He had made a promise to humanity in Daniel chapter 9. And right on time he came. He went through with it. And because of it, we have hope. 